<laughs> Thanks. So what I want to do is, is give you a couple of tools that are used in uh, looking at the K30 smooth varieties and then actually show you something about the K30 smooth varieties over the complex numbers. So the first thing is motivic cohomology. And um, there are sheaves, ZI, on smooth schemes over your favorite field, K. <clears throat> so that um, the hypercomology so the H N of X with coefficients in Z parentheses I is motivic cohomology. And you can take uh, cohomology with coefficients and uh, think of it as Zariski cohomology or Nisnevich cohomology, and it doesn't matter. Um, uh, This is only defined for i greater than or equal to zero. So there's only a couple of, of these known, and um, so let's see here. So the first of them is that if you twist with zero, then you're just getting just Z. Um, and so the reason is because the Z of zero is the same thing as just the, the, the sheaf, which is Z in degree zero. So you're just getting integral cohomology. Um, and the, the next one is uh, sheaf one. So I have to think about this, but the reason is because uh, of a shift. So zero of n is equal to zero. Uh, H zero of x with coefficients in O x star if n is equal to one. Uh, H one of x with coefficients in O x star if n is equal to two and zero otherwise. And you might recognize these as the units, and you might recognize these as the Picard group. Otherwise, we don't really know much. Um, we also have a theorem. Um, well, let's see. Yeah, okay, so. So there are, um, Adams operations psi i on uh, the k theory of x and the eigenvalues for psi to the k, let's make this psi to the k, is equal to k to the i give a decomposition of the K-theory. Well, the problem is that you can't talk about eigenvalues of an abelian group, but you can talk about the eigenvalues of a vector space over the rational numbers. And so we would say that this is the direct sum of the KN parentheses I of X. So if I put the parentheses I of X, then implicitly we're tensoring with Q. <clears throat> and k i n of x is isomorphic to h 2 i minus n of x coefficients in z i, whoops, tensored q. And then that's the same thing as h 2 i minus n of x with coefficients in q i. So at this point, you see that I, I'm sort of introducing a little bit of extra notation. Uh, that if you take 
this sheaf of abelian groups, and you tensor it with Q, you get a sheaf of, of rational vector spaces, and that's QI. And, and while I'm at it, uh, if you take Z of I and you tensor it with Z mod M, then you get this, and then I can talk about motivic cohomology with coefficients in these sheaves. So this, this, is, uh, this is a very useful result. Uh, And this goes together with um, something else to say that these are uniquely divisible. I'm sorry? I have. I have. Okay, so let's not do that. Let's try to think of a different way to say what I'm trying to say. Uh, there is a spectral sequence. And the spectral sequence starts off with E2 PQ equals to uh, motivic cohomology. So I have to think about how this works. P minus Q uh, of X with coefficients in Z, Q, minus Q, and it converges off to the K theory of minus P minus Q of X. So I want to draw the picture of this, and uh, so this is, this is the line P equals to zero. So when P is equal to zero, I have H minus Q of ZQ. So I have H zero <coughs> of Z zero. Uh, I have H uh, one of Z one. I have H two of Z two and so on. Um, Let's see, uh, this is going to get too complicated unless I make some simplifying uh, assumptions. So I'm going to assume that X is X actually just the spectrum of a, of a field. Uh, so when I do that, um, here's a theorem. So if X is a field, then H uh, transcendence degree equal to D over an algebraically closed field, then, uh, then there's nothing out here. So uh, that says that if Q is greater than P, then H P of X with co well, let me write F coefficients in Z Q is equal to zero. So that means that out here we have nothing. Do I need it the other way around? Well, let me let me write down H zero parentheses one, H zero parentheses two, H one parentheses 2, so this is this would be like H3 parentheses 2, so it's the other way around, as Christian said. Yeah, the transcendence degree hasn't played a role yet. But when we get down here, we get the HD of F with coefficients in Z, D. And after that, there's nothing. That's where the transcendence degree plays a role. And then what we have is sort of a, of a diagram that goes down like this. So here is H03, H13, H23, and uh, H3 
three three. And uh, over here we have HP of F with coefficients in ZQ, where um, this index, P minus Q, is strictly negative. So that is the same thing as saying P is less than I can't do the algebra. P minus Q is strictly less than negative. That says that P is strictly less than Q. That's not the same P and Q. That's what's cra driving me crazy. Okay, so the point is that there's this vanishing conjecture. And the Motivic version of this says um, these groups on the diagonal and all of these groups. So, all right, Hn of f coefficients in zi is equal to zero if n is less than or equal to zero unless uh, n equals i equals zero. Because when n equals i equals zero, you get this group, and that's just the z. So conjecturally, all of these things that I've circled are zero. And so then the spectral sequence just goes down like this. Second thing that happens, so let me just interpret this. Because I have a field, this is just z. This is the first cohomology of a field with coefficients in units, so that's just the units of um, no, it's, it's this one here. It's the zeroth cohomology of f with coefficients in the units, so it's the units. So this is the units of the field, and this is equal to z, and this is equal to k2 of f. There's a shift. You see there's a shift? n equals 1, h0. That's why I had to stop and think about it when I was writing it down. Okay, so in fact, what we actually have is a theorem that says that Hn of f with coefficients in z, parentheses n, is isomorphic to Milner K theory, n of f. So that's why I, I'm writing, let me just get rid of this zero for a second. That's why I'm writing that this is K2 of f. And so we actually know that this one is equal to zero because there's no place for the differentials to go. Uh, well, anyway, the point is that this is okay. But we don't know about any of these. Here we would have K3, Milner of the field, and K3, Milner of the field is not the same thing as uh, K3 of the, the field. And here we have K4 of the Milner, uh, the, the next one would be K4 Milner of the field. Now here's a, here's a fun thing, and the fun thing is that if I'm looking at uh, the integers, I mean not, I need a field, so the rational numbers, um, then we know that um, inside of K4 we have an element which is mi minus 1 times minus 1 times minus 1 times minus 1. But we also know that minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 in K4 of the rational numbers comes from eta to the fourth in pi 4 stable of, well, pi 4 stable of the Sears spectrum. And here it's equal to 0 for topological reasons. And so that means that this is equal to 0. But it's non-zero in the K4 Milner. And so that means that there exists a non-trivial differential. So what that means is that this spectral sequence cannot possibly degenerate in all cases. But I'm going to show you a case where it does degenerate in half an hour, if I get lucky. Okay, so the next thing is that this vanishing 
conjectural vanishing for all of this, together with this. So if I put if I put 2i minus n in a range where I'm out here, conjecturally this is zero, this says that k n parentheses i of f is equal, so there's a upside down question mark here. Uh, if uh, i is less than or equal to n over 2, unless, of course, i equals n equals to zero. So there's a conjecture in K-theory and there's a conjecture in motivic cohomology and they're equivalent. Now, uh, this particular vanishing conjecture, uh, Balenson made this conjecture uh, without saying anything about n equals to zero. And Soleil made this conjecture without, um, <clears throat> with, with, as I've written it, and the point is that the original conjectures weren't exactly the same, but um, I, I've had a conversation with Balenson and with Soule, and they agree that the n less than or equal to zero is the way that the conjecture should read. So conjecturally, all of this stuff is equal to zero, and you just have something going on down in this range. And that gives you a lot of ability to say something about the k-theory of fields, especially when you're looking at k3 and k4, where there aren't a lot of room for differentials. Okay. Yes. With integer coefficients, this believed to be true. But um, yeah, so here's a remark. So I was slightly jumping ahead of myself, but all these groups are these groups that are conjecture B0. So this is H N. Uh, well, yeah, F doesn't doesn't really matter. Let me keep keep it with F. Z parentheses I uh, are uniquely divisible. At this point, I'm going to start writing U period D period for uniquely divisible, because uniquely divisible is really long, and that is the same thing as it's saying it's a Q vector space. So since we know that these groups are uniquely divisible, uh, we can tensor them with Q and it doesn't do anything, right? So that's, uh, that's a good remark. So there's this um, group, and let me go back to X. If I take uh, So there is um, a lot of technology that goes into making a precise definition of K-theory with coefficients correct. If you um, are working with spectra, then one way of doing this is you take the uh, spectrum for algebraic K-theory, you smash it with a mod M more space, and then you take homotopy groups. Um, but there are lots of other ways of thinking about this, and the point is that uh, it, it fits into the sequence, and because because the co-kernel of this is this group mod M, and the kernel of this is the M torsion subgroup of this, uh, so this is the set of all A such that M times A is equal to zero. That's what that little notation of an M next to an abelian group.
So you have this short exact sequence. And so with this short exact sequence, if you know something with coefficients of mod m, then hopefully you can construct things about the m torsion here, or you can construct something here. Okay. There is also a spectral sequence with mod m coefficients. So it looks almost exactly the same as the one up there. But now it's going to converge to the K theory of X with coefficients in Z mod M. Now, um, here's a technical point, and the technical point is that if you're in characteristic P and P divides M, then crazy things happen. And we don't really understand that situation very well. And I could go on and on and on about Durand Witt complexes, but the point is that we're going to avoid. Uh, that. So I want to assume that the characteristic of F does not divide M. <clears throat> so this spectral sequence, again, we have something like this. And then down here we would have HD of F with coefficients in Z mod M. And this is D and then zeros. And here is H0, 1, and so on. And now here is the nice thing. There's a big theorem. Um, <clears throat> we can call it the norm residue theorem. But if you look in the literature, this theorem is called the Blockado conjecture, the Balenson conjecture, the Milner conjecture. It's got lots and lots of different names in the literature. And roughly speaking, it was proved by Voivodsky with a lot of input from Marcus Rost. Uh, but what it says is that the, um, the motivic cohomology of a field with coefficients in Z mod M parentheses I is the same thing as the atoll cohomology of F with coefficients in the nth roots of unity twisted I times. If N is less than or equal to I and zero else. <clears throat> so what that says is that we really have zeros out there. And what it does is it takes the, the, um, the H1 groups there and gives you a contribution to the H0 groups down here. So here's H02, et cetera. Uh, so here's H0 going on down, and here's HD, D plus 1. Here's H0, D plus 1. And it just keeps going down in this direction. Um, but zero here, and zero here, and zero here. So the spectral sequence is much more nicely confined. And this spectral sequence gives you lots and lots of good information about what's going on. So let's just do a stupid calculation. Suppose F is algebraically closed, and again, I'm going to just make this assumption without writing it down. Then the higher cohomology of F is going to vanish. And so what you get is that the K theory of F with coefficients in Z mod M is equal to zero if N is odd, and it's equal to Z mod M if N is even, and of course, greater than or equal to zero. <clears throat> now, one of the things that happens in this particular case is that there's a bot element in 
K2 with coefficients in Z mod M corresponding to the uh, mth root of unity in the fields, the field. So remember I have this, this sequence right here. So if I have an element in the M torsion, the, an element of exponent M in K1, then I get an element in K2 with coefficients. And so that's exactly what I've done here. <coughs> so in this particular case, in fact, it's equal to Z mod M beta polynomial ring as a ring. So if you have an algebraically closed field, this is what happens. And then if you decompress all of this information, then what you get is the Kn of f. So this is again f equals f bar. Uh, so it's zero. I mean, it's z if n is equal to zero. It's equal to... Uh, Q mod Z, uh, so twisted I plus a uniquely divisible group, if N is odd, um, and it's equal to 2I minus 1, and it's a uniquely divisible group if N is even and bigger than 0. So these are the groups of an algebraically closed field of characteristic not equal to, well, I, I guess since I'm avoiding everything, this would be characteristic zero. So in particular, the complex numbers. So if I looked at K1 of the complex, complex numbers, that's the complex numbers units. And what I'm saying is that this is Q mod Z plus a uniquely divisible group, which is true. If you, if you just think about every divisible abelian group as being the direct sum of a uniquely divisible group in a and a bunch of, of torsion groups, and the torsion groups are, well, this is, these are the rest of unity. So this is an example of what happens that you can compute the K-theory with finite coefficients, and then you can let the, the coefficients vary, and then somehow or other you can recover what's going on integrally. So it's Q minus ZI. Ah. So Q minus ZI means Q mod Z is an abelian group, but if you have some subfield, uh, unfortunately I learned that subfields should be F and the total fields should be E, then the Galois group, then G can act as uh, twisted by I. So that's just a sort of a formal bookkeeping device that I want to remember that, for example, if I'm trying to compute the K-theory of the real numbers, so the Galois group is a cyclic group of order two, that the action of the Galois group relates the K-theory of the real numbers to the K-theory of the complex numbers, and there's, there is an, a Galois group action, and the, if I is even, then the Galois group action is trivial, and if I is odd, then the Galois group action is non-trivial. So what that means is that sometimes you get a minus one, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the fixed points of Q mod Z under the action where, where the Galois group is acting by multiplication by minus one, the fixed group is just Z mod two. So when you're looking at the K-theory of the reals, you just get Z mod twos in a lot of places, whereas you would get Q mod Zs if you were looking at, uh, at, at, at the other case, the, the, the odd case, uh, uh, the even case. So. Um, so for example, if I'm looking at K1 of the reals, there's a there's this Galois group twist, and so what I hear it saying is that the torsion group should be Z mod two. And in fact, the torsion group of the real number, the units of the real numbers, does have a Z mod two in it. So it's 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 mostly a bookkeeping device meant for comparing with fields which are not algebraically closed.
Now, um, I wrote this spectral sequence out for fields, but it's also uh, perfectly good for algebraic varieties. The difference with algebraic varieties is that this uh, norm residue theorem doesn't exactly work. So the version of the norm residue theorem that you have to use for a variety is a lot more technically complicated to state. So I'll just say it and then I won't elaborate on it. So, um, yeehaw. So over a field, we're talking about a tall cohomology. And there's this functor R, R a lower star, which takes a tall sheaves to Zariski sheaves. So if I take mu m twisted i, that's an ideal sheet. That's a, that's a sheaf of uh, of uh, a tall sheaf. Uh, ah, it's an a tall sheaf. If I take r a lower star, oh, this well, hang on for a second. It takes a tall sheaves to complexes of Zariski sheaves. So this is a complex of Zariski sheaves. And then what you have to do is you have to take tau less than or equal to i. And then the assertion is that this is, uh, this is z mod m parentheses i. So that means that the cohomology of a variety x with coefficients in z mod m parentheses i is the hypercohomology uh, Zariski on X. So here's an N that's the same. And that um, then you have to slug in all of this stuff. As I said, it's more complicated. I don't, don't want to really talk about this, but um, what I do want to talk about is uh, X a curve. <laughs> so, um, so it kind of goes back to uh, K1 and K2 and, uh, and, and residue symbols. And uh, it's, it's a sort of a long story and it's distracting, but it, it has to do with K1 and K2. And the way that people thought of reciprocity back in the 1930s. It's not 100 years ago, but it's close. Anyway, so if, if x is a curve, then what this says is that, um, <clears throat> ah, one of the things that you get out of this is that hn of x, z mod m, i, is equal to zero if n is less than zero. So you still get this, this vanishing in negative degrees with finite coefficients. And what that says is that the K theory, um, well, it says that the appropriate part of the K theory is, is, is uniquely divisible that uh, I was talking about before. So anyway, the point is that uh, here if we take H1, uh, well, let me write the, the thing down here. So here's H0 of X. So that is going to be Z mod M. Here's H1 of X with coefficients in Z1. So this is uh, H0. And here's H1 of X with coefficients in Z mod M1. And here's a zero, and here's a zero, and here's a zero. So this is the Picard group of x, uh, let's see, so the m torsion in the Picard group, if I'm assuming I'm over an algebraically closed field. 
And so then the rest of this spectral sequence is just like before, and here we have zeros. So here I have a zero. Uh, wait a second, I, I, I just messed up, because what happens is when you pass from integer coefficients to finite coefficients, all of the groups shift one to the left. And so what I'd written here gets shifted over to there. So here's H1 with coefficients in, in, in of x with coefficients in mu, m. Here's H2 of x with coefficients in mu, m. Uh, no. H0, this is H1, this is H2, and this is the Picard group of x mod m. So here's H0, H1, H2 of x with coefficients in z mod m. And then a marvelous thing happens, and that is that you have cohomological dimension 2 for a curve, and so you have nothing here. So here you have H2 of x with coefficients in z mod m, and here you have H1, and here you have H0, and so on. Now, another marvelous thing happens, and that is because you have an algebraically closed field, all of the nth roots of unity are in your field, and so the Galois group can't possibly do anything, and so you can identify these funny coefficients with just regular coefficients z mod m. And so what that means is that all of these h0 groups are the same, and all of these h1 groups are the same, and all of these h2 groups are the same, and there's zeros down here. So where can you possibly have differentials? Well, the differentials could possibly go from h0 over 2 and down 1, but they end up in 0. So there's no differentials. So that says that the k-theory of x with coefficients in z mod m is the atoll cohomology of x with coefficients in z mod m adjoin the bot element, again, polynomially. And if you de decompress this, if you, pass, if you let m vary, and you sort of think about the comparison that I have on the top board with finite coefficients and integer coefficients, then what this tells you is that the k-theory of x with no funny coefficients, just regular coefficients, is going to be what? Well, it's going to be z plus the Picard group of x if n is equal to 0. So that's this group. Then here you're going to have the units of x. Well, what is that? That's q mod z plus a uniquely divisible group. Ah. then you actually get this. And again, I want to emphasize that the Picard group of x is z plus r mod z to the 2g. So that is the same thing as z uh, plus q mod z to the 2g plus r mod q. Uh, to the 2G, and this is an example of a uniquely divisible vector space. You just think about forming a basis of the real numbers over the rational numbers, and then uh, that makes the real numbers a vector space over the rational numbers, and, and you just have a lot of fun with set theory there. Um, so the point is that the pattern is still the same here as it is here. But you get this, this understanding of the k-theory of x, except that you don't understand the uniquely divisible group part of it. And that is sort of representative of the status of calculations 
that we have, and that is that we understand um, the torsion part and the cotorsion part fairly well, but we don't understand the uniquely divisible parts of algebraic K theory very well. There are things called regulators, and um, I'm looking at the clock and thinking, no, I'm not going to talk about regulators. Um, there are things called regulators, which map the K theory to uh, the complex numbers. And if you take the, uh, the if, you, if your field is, is like a number field, then the, um, then the image of that regulator map is going to be a Z. And so then if you take a, a different regulator for every real embedding, then you get R1 real embeddings, then you get a Z to the R1, and then you can pick up what's going on with the number field using regulators. But we don't know exactly what the image of the regulators are. There are these fancy issues about pi coming in. And, um, and I promise not to say anything about that. So I haven't said anything about that, did I? You didn't hear that. OK. Uh, well, I might as well just push this up and erase. So if you want to understand what's going on with surfaces, you can sort of do exactly the same game. But instead of doing that, what I want to do is uh, do all smooth varieties at one shot. And I want to do all smooth varieties at one shot. Then um, then I have to uh, introduce churn classes. And since no good discussion of K-theory uh, can happen without discussing churn classes, that's, that's, uh, that's just fine. OK, so churn classes. So in algebraic topology, we have churn classes, and the churn classes for algebraic topology uh, land in integral cohomology, typically. Well, so what happens here is you have a CI that's going to go from Kn of x to h 2n minus i of x with coefficients in z parentheses i. To y minus n. Oh, <laughs> I thought I wrote 2y minus n. I'm having a dyslexic moment here. Excuse me. Okay, so um, uh, so h2i minus, well, let me write a star there so that I don't make the same mistake that I just made before. So there are all kinds of maps which go from motivic cohomology to lots of other theories. And um, since I want to focus on complex varieties, I just want to focus on two of them. And one of them is that you can map to topological cohomology. And what happens here is that if you have the K theory of X, there's the K theory of the topological space X. And here is the CI, which goes to the, uh, I'm going to put a star there just because I'm running out of space. And then here you have the cohomology of X topological with coefficients in Z. And here you have the topologist churn class, and here you have the algebraist churn class, and this diagram commutes. So 
whatever churn classes we're building, they're compatible with the churn classes that uh, the topologies use for topological K theory. Uh, another uh, churn class, if I take n equals to zero, what happens? Well, if I take n equals to zero, 2i minus n just becomes 2i, and you get kn of x goes to h, no, k0 of x, ci lands in 2i of x with coefficients in z i, and that's the Chow group of co-dimension i cycles on x, and these are the ones that Grotten Dieck invented in 1957. So that's not a definition. No, well, it's recovering an old definition. So what we're doing, this, this huge machine that you build in order to build churn classes doesn't really change what happens in the classical settings. So these churn classes, um, so there were some lecture notes that Quillen gave at, at MIT, which were sort of never published. And then the churn classes were uh, written up by various people, and the, the cat's meow was this very, very long paper by Henry Gillet, which is very hard to read. Um, so it's, it's difficult to find a, a decent exposition of this. There's an exposition by Soule, there's an exposition in my K-book, and maybe that's the easiest thing to tell you that, uh, if you look in the K-book, I've got lots of references, and then you can go to the K-book, find the reference that you like, and then read the, the, read, read the original source. Uh, but, but anyway, we have lots of churn classes. And I should say something about Deligne cohomology. Um, so this is the hypercohomology uh, analytic on X. Um, Please forgive me for having two eyes, but the eye, this twist of an eye is, 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 this, is this twist. And so um, this is the, uh, the, the, the Duran complex. And so you have the integers mapping in, and then you take the hypercohomology of that. And the advantage of this is that um, there are lots and lots of connections of this cohomology. For example, um, if I take the Deligne cohomology and I multiply by some number, which maybe I'm using M, so what happens to the coefficients? The Duran complex is uniquely divisible. So on the Duran complex, I'm not really doing anything. I'm just pro uh, providing an isomorphism. But on the integers, I have the integers going to the integers by multiplication by m. And so what happens here is is that you get that. And then there's a long exact sequence. So there's, there's a connection with atal cohomology. And in fact, um, there are also churn classes with coefficients. And they're compatible with this, and the compatibility with this says that if I take something in K2i of x with coefficients in z mod m, and I map it over to uh, K2i minus 1 of x with integer coefficients, and I apply my ci to get to this cohomology group. And then I map this over by the boundary map to the cohomology group that I have for my Deligne cohomology. But that diagram commutes. So you can work with finite coefficients or you can work with integer coefficients. And so for example, if I take the bot element to the i, that's an element in here. I have a product rule which tells me that this goes down to minus 1 to the i minus 1 
times I minus 1 factorial times, uh, well, let's see. So which one have I done? I've done 2i minus 2i, so that's h0. Uh, so h0 is, um, this is, this is in, in z mod m. So that means that if I take the bot element and I map it over to here, I have something in the odd cohomology, then I can map it down so I can understand things. And um, what I'm going to say next is going to use this sort of implicitly. Okay. So that's the part that I wanted to say about churn classes, that they exist. There's lots of compatibilities that uh, So now let's consider the function field of an algebraic variety, a d-dimensional algebraic variety, so something of dimension d. Then um, we have the Milner K theory of F mod M with the bot element. And this maps into the K theory of F with coefficients in Z mod M. So the bot element is in K2 of, well, it's in K2 of the complex numbers with coefficients in Z mod M. So in particular, you could think of it as element as K2 of F. But if I'm going to replace F by a variety, I want to have it somewhere that's it's defined everywhere. So let's just put it there. So we have a map from here to here. Now, if you remember the spectral sequence for this, the E2 terms of the spectral sequence were all just cohomology groups, and they were all multiplied by the bot element. This Milner K theory of F mod M was what we had running down the y-axis. And so what that means is that this maps bijectively onto the E2 terms of that spectral sequence. And from there, without too much work, you get this. So we understand completely what the K theory of F is with uh, mod M coefficients, as long as we understand this. Oh, and I didn't tell you this. But remember that the K theory of F with coefficients in Z mod M is isomorphic to the Milner K theory of F with coefficients in Z mod M. That doesn't make any sense. The Milner K theory of F mod M is isomorphic to the Atoll cohomology. Uh, this star is the same thing as this star. And here's the Z mod M. So this is really a statement about atoll cohomology, and what this says is that the, the Quillen K theory of F, if you ignore the uniquely divisible part, it's just coming from atoll, K theory, atoll cohomology. So if you play some yoga, so I'm looking at the clock, I'm thinking that I don't have time to tell you about yoga, so we're going to omit the yoga lesson. Um, but basically, you take this, and you take these Deline churn classes that I've described up there, and you use compatibility of this diagram. So those, those are the ingredients that go into the yoga. And then what you get is that the K theory of F are uniquely divisible, or I mean, are divisible groups. for all n greater than or equal to 1, and the m torsion, so the m part of the k theory of f has to be isomorphic to the m plus first k theory of f with coefficients in z mod m. Uh, wait a second, n plus first. And I know what that is because that's given by this formula.
At this point, I'm just going to put a star because I don't have time. So there you go. So these are these are divisible groups, and the m torsion in them is completely given by the tau cohomology of f. The uniquely divisible part we don't have a clue about. Okay, so this isn't so bad. Okay, so now let's let an X be a smooth, uh, let's say projected just for the sake of simplicity, algebraic loop variety over the complex numbers. And the topological space X of C has finitely generated KU groups. So if I put it in there, uh, there's some torsion group and then there's a Z to the, let's say RN uh, and this is this is torsion free. So the, uh, the topological K theory of this says there's a finite CW complex. It's they're all finitely generated abelian groups and the structure theorem of a finitely generated abelian group is that it's a free group plus a torsion group. So that's exactly the two pieces that I'm gonna use. Well, all right, so I'll just tell you the theorem. So the K theory of F information plus um, the Atal cohomology of X, coefficients in Z mod M, uh, gives you what the K theory with finite coefficients is. And the theorem that you get out of this. So, um, Kn of x is equal to, so let me just make sure that I get my coefficients right. If n is greater than or equal to the dimension of x, did I say the dimension of x? Okay, so then we get This torsion part, uh, which is coming up over there, plus a Q mod Z, and that is corresponding to the topological K group, which is the next one up, plus a uniquely divisible group. And the idea is that if we have this K relative group, so here is the K theory of X, and here is the topological K theory of X. Um, here's KU star minus one of X of C. So here's a Z to the R, here's a Q to the R, and here's a Q mod Z to the R. 
So this shows you how the, um, and then the, the T um, N goes over to the TN. So this shows you how the algebraic K-theory and the topological K-theory play together, that the finite torsion, the TN, corresponds identically to both of them. Uh, but if you have this uniquely divisible business, that in the relative group you have a Q to the R, here you have a Q mod Z, and here you have a Z to the R. And so we, one of the things that happened in the 90s is people took piadic completions. When you take piadic completion, the piadic completion of this gives you a ZP to the R. And the Q mod Z here, when you piadically complete, pops up in one degree. And so therefore, these are isomorphism after piadic completions. And so a lot of theorems from the 1990s say basically that these groups are the same after piadic completion. But now we understand. Oh, so uh, after piadic completion. Then the K-theory of X is isomorphic to the topological K-theory of X. Piatically completed. So just as a technical point, what I mean is you take the topological space, you piatically complete the topological space, and then you take homotopy groups. Okay, so I've run out of time, so that's a good place to stop. Yeah, this one. Depend on I. I see no dependence on I and quotient. I'm I'm sorry. Where are you looking? I'm looking where there is an I. Here there's an I. Here here there's an I. The line multiplication by n. Step I and they retard cumulatively. All right. So there's U M tensor I. But the point is that since I was over the complex numbers, the nth roots of unity are just a cyclic group of order m, and the Galois group is acting trivially, so the twisting by i doesn't matter. So I was using a sort of a notational short, shortcut. So that mu m tensor i is isomorphic to z mod m over, let's like, say, the complex numbers. Sorry, when you when you get going on this, what you what you look for is notational shortcuts, because your hand really gets cramped from writing all that stuff out. That's why I'm writing u period d period instead of uniquely divisible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope that should be here, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. That was sort of a, in my mind, a continuation, but I forgot to write, rewrite the hypothesis. Thanks. Yes? So the general is the topological homology of X much easier to handle comparing with the K-theory. Sure it is. Uh, so here's a, here's a theorem, uh, which is, I'm not, well, it's SJ4. So X over the complex numbers is a variety. That the etal cohomology of X coefficients in Z mod M is isomorphic to the topological cohomology of the topological space coefficients in Z mod M. So if you have a variety like projective space, then you know a lot about its topology because if every, every first year algebraic topology class tells you what the cohomology of projective space is. So that's one example of a space where you know completely what the right-hand side is. And so now you know the left-hand side as well. Chuck for an um, excellent series of four talks. <laughs>